Thank you everyone for coming today. My name is Colt McCandless. I'm a developer advocate at Google, focusing on gaming and web technologies in general. Uh, you see my email address here, colton at google.com. And we are here today to talk about a very, very important topic. We're here to talk about texture compression. Now, before we get too started, uh, I'm going to need to see a show of hands. How many of you in here ha have actually shipped a product, a video game, on a console? So Xbox 360, PS3, Nintendo, DS for that matter? Okay, good. So out of those hands, uh, you can put them down and, and we'll get a new set. Out of those hands, how many of you have ever fought with texture footprint in memory? Okay, good, 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 good. So uh, obviously you know that compressing your textures is a big problem and that most importantly, you spend a lot of time trying to fight your memory constraints against what your artists are producing. Well, today we're here to talk about that specifically. And what we want to talk about is DXT is not enough. Now, I know there's hardware architecture differences with compressed textures and PVR and ECT and all these other things. So I hope you take what we're talking about today and how it's being applied to DXT texturing. And I hope you apply it to some of these other things that may be platform specific. So, all right, let's get started then. So uh, texture footprints matters for games, as we've already talked about this. How many times have you been down to the wire or down to memory and needed like an extra five megabytes for animations or 10 megabytes for sound? And you go back and you do your statistic gathering and find that you're losing 50% or 60% of your entire memory footprint just for texture assets. And there's, there's tons of different reasons for this. You know, they could be uh, need to be high res, they could be too many MIP chains, or the artists author them at 2048s when they only occupy a 64 by 64 pixel set on the screen, uh, whatever the reasons, right? Uh, for us, this is a big problem because it, it's, as a console developer, you spend a lot of time fighting this. Retail doesn't really care a lot about this, though. Uh, there's a great article, I forget which site posted it, uh, where John Carmack actually went to the head of, of their publisher at the time and said, hey, I've got an amazing new technology. Uh, it's called Mega Texture. Uh, and, and it's awesome. You can stream in infinite detail and it's fantastic. The problem is that we're now looking at like 17 gigabytes of data just for one game. Uh, and in the article, it actually says that the head of the publisher said, hey, that's fantastic. I love it. This will push our Blu-ray sales for video games. Uh, the point of this is that uh, for retail developers, that's good, right? They're, they're giving out this physical medium and pushing this physical medium to consoles and to PC developers, uh, the, the 17 gig Blu-rays. Uh, this is great. Uh, but for us digital, distrib distrib bleh, us digital distribution outlets, uh, as well as consumers in general, this isn't a good thing, right? Waiting for 17 to 40 gigabytes worth of data to play your game is, is not good at all. Uh, it takes time, it, it creates a, a lag between what the user's expectation is and pay rate is to when they actually experience the content. And there's a large gap there that is directly correlated to how many users buy your game, how many users continue to play your game, and how many users just get stopped at the front door. And as we all know, especially the indies that may be in the audience today, that's huge, right? Like you want these people giving you money and creating barriers to their experience is a bad thing. So when we talk about texture compression systems, uh, because we want to avoid 17 gigabytes, right? We, we, want, to th we want to move down. Uh, you need to look at it as a triangle. Uh, for instance, this is, this is a nice little understanding here. And again, we're talking about texture decompression. So we're talking about the, the runtime decompressing of textures. Uh, it's kind of a, a performance triangle where you need to sort of optimize based upon your game and your title between the quality of the decompressed image, uh, the size and the footprint of the in-memory representation, and then how fast you can actually decompress that data. Um, and, and depending on your game, you'll find a different point on this triangle. Uh, right, so for some of the, the uh, id stuff, you may be more towards decompression speed and size than quality. Uh, for Farmville, obviously you would want uh, quality and size as a better metric. Uh, maybe speed is not a big of an issue, who knows. Um, but you really need to take this, this triangle into thought when you're talking about decompression and algorithms in general. And hopefully you'll think about this while we're talking about our stuff today too. So the state of the art for this process, let's talk about what you all are already doing. So you should all know this, you should all be familiar with this as we start forward, right? Uh, so the way that people handle textures today is the artist usually generates some PSD file in Photoshop. This PSD file is, is converted to a DXT texture either through Microsoft's tool or NVIDIA tools or Compressinator from AMD ATI. Uh, and then that data is usually just thrown sort of batch process ad hoc into a zip file or some sort of compressed binary archive. And then that archive uh, is then you know, put on disk or put into memory, shipped out with the product. And when a level load or the game loads, usually what happens is um, 
that data is copied, uh, the zip file is opened up in memory at, at runtime. Uh, the, the entire zip archive is either loaded into memory or kept on disk and then streamed from. And that data is copied right from the memory or right from the compressed version right to the GPU. Right? So the DXT data that's in the archive and in memory just gets effectively mem copied over. Uh, and this is usually fine, but the problem here is that you don't want to always keep this process going because when you open your zip archive, you either keep the entire thing in memory or you keep it you know, all on disk and stream from it. And the point here is that you should not keep your entire zip in archive. Uh, I remember when we were making a, a pre at my previous life, we were putting out a, a console title on the Xbox 360, and we had archives around uh, you know, four gigs. Well, the problem was uh, the hardware we were working on only had 512 megs of RAM that we could actually work with. So obviously, keeping the entire thing in memory is not a good idea. Uh, on the other side of this, actually hitting the optical disk to stream in your data is not always available as well. Uh, in addition to that, some of the data that exists in your archive is not actually needed. So for instance, let's say you're loading a level, right? Uh, when you load a level, you're going to end up, there's going to be lots of data. There's going to be uh, bounding volume hierarchies, quad trees, navigational meshes, there's going to be animations for characters. Uh, some of this stuff can actually be loaded once and then thrown away, right? Uh, while other items and other representations need to be loaded and continuously used. And this is where you sort of get the divide between sort of uh, load and forget and then load and continue using between data and textures. Um, it's, so you kind of go, okay, well, if I need to load, if I have a zip archive that represents level seven, uh, and I only need to use the first 25% during load time, and then the rest of it I need at runtime for textures or whatever, then it makes sense to kind of segment that out and say, okay, well, here's, here's the preload stuff for level seven, and then there, here's the runtime stuff for level seven. Uh, and then there's sort of a rabbit hole that once you start thinking about this, you kind of go down this rabbit hole and you end up in utter madness. Uh, but you don't get the free tea or the cool hat or the rabbit running around, but you get the, the craziness of, of the experience. Um, because what happens is you start to, to bin sort all of your content around and figure, figure out these optimal solutions. Uh, that, that's really just madness. What, really what you should be doing um, is you should find a way to hyper compress your textures so that they turn into a load once solution. And the rest of this talk is going to be focused explicitly on this sort of technique. The idea here is that you're going to want to hyper-compress your textures in some way that you can load them into main memory and keep them in main memory for the entire duration of the game or the level or what you need. And then on demand, decompress them from whatever format they're in to a GPU format and then throw them away if you need. Uh, and this is actually a very powerful instance, right? Uh, ID Tech 5 has sort of made waves with this, right? I've been hearing about mega texture for almost six years, I think, seven years has been the big thing, and Rage uh, has finally shipped, uh, and you can go play the game and sort of see the, the, the rage of uh, ID Tech 5 and sort of what happens. Basically, they, they realized that this was a problem early on, right? They had tons and tons of texture data, and the way that they handled this was they store the textures in this hyper-compressed format. Basically, they are, uh, there are some of the early papers by uh, Van Wavern, uh, you can find them on the Intel developer site, actually talk about creating a variant of JPEG, which is a, a DCT block-based format, and actually compressing them to DXT at runtime. So basically, offline, they would compress them to this lossy, lossy style format, DCT, and then at runtime, they'd take that DCT data and then convert it over to DXT, which was then mem copied to the GPU, right? Uh, the cool thing about this is, according to their research, they were getting about 112 uh, megapixels or megatexels a second on dual core, which that's a lot of megapixels, megatexels a second. That's, that's a lot of texture data to be effectively streaming, converting, and, and moving around. Uh, some of the downsides of this, though, that, that aren't really that published, but, but when you actually start implementing that algorithm and realizing what's going on here, or if you've spent a lot of time with texture compression, you fir first realize that this is very processor intensive. You're spending a lot of CPU time redoing the same sort of work, right? You're taking a DCT texture, converting it to DXT. In addition to that, this actually converts and introduces two times the amount of noise. DCT uh, actually is a lossy codec. It's a lossy form. So what happens is when you compress your texture, it's going to introduce noise into the texture. And then when you decompress the texture to compress it to DXT, DXT is also a lossy format. So what's happening is you're introducing error, reverting that error, but, but keeping it around to some respect, and then introducing new error again. So you're actually getting two times the amount of error in your image during the compression process. In addition to that, because the fact that this is the DXT conversion is happening at runtime, 
it means that you can't spend a ton of time optimizing for how your DXT blocks should be considered. Right? Basically, you have to resort to a box fit or a best fit algorithm, which might not actually produce the best color correlation ratio. There's, there's tons of algorithms out there, we're going to talk about some today, um, that, that allow you to get a better quality if you're working at it offline. So here's the idea. Here's the whole point of this talk that I'd like to talk about today. So what if, what if we approach this from a different angle? What if, instead of taking uh, an existing compressed form, decompressing it, and translating it into DXT at runtime, what if we started with the DXT data initially? And we took that DXT data and we hypercompressed it. So we hypercompressed the DXT data more, such that at runtime, all we're doing is a decompression step to get us our original DXT input. So this is the idea. The idea is that we don't introduce any new error data with this, right? Because it's just going from something compressed to back to DXT. And then we can actually store this in memory hypercompressed. So we load it from our zip file, keep it in some section of, the, of memory that we're not using all the time, and then we decompress directly to DXT whenever our view frustum changes or we have a, a cache invalidation or we, we do a flush or something along those lines. So um, in order to test if this is the right direction to go, uh, we need some sort of test images uh, to sort of prove uh, both decompression time and size and speeds and whatnot like that. So uh, you know, anytime you're doing image compression block tests, you have to, you have to produce some sort of conical representation to, to take a look at. So uh, what I've created is actually a random collection of images. Uh, all images behave differently. Um, I think it would be sort of irresponsible on my side to just use one type of image. So I've actually included a bunch of images of my uh, set from different things. Some are from games, the, the actual PSD, the source images, the TGA is uncompressed, so there's no noise being added there. Uh, some are public. Uh, for example, the famous Lena image, uh, which if you don't know who Lena is in respect to compression, please go look at it and take a look at it. Um, and some are from image libraries. Uh, the Codec image library is actually fantastic. It's a lot of high resolution images that are great to test against your own compression algorithms. Um, and then all the numbers I'm going to be showing today for these compression processes actually include the DDS headers, uh, which is about 128 bytes. So this is going to skew the results slightly, um, but if you take that into account, you know, it, you, you have to have the header of the texture, how big it is, how many MIPS it is, what the format is, all these other things. Um, so, so take that in. And then any percentage values that I produce on my slides are actually in amount of reduction. This is, this is basically saying how much has been reduced from the original format. So that you're seeing sort of this large delta to see what we're saving as all of these things come together. So before we move on, let's take a look at a typical DXT block. And for the sake of this talk, I'm going to focus on DXT1 because I think, you know, understanding it from here allows us to launch off the different algorithms, DXT3, 5, DXTN, all these other sorts of things. So a DXT block is constructed likewise. Uh, first off, it starts by storing a high color and a low color in a 565 bit palette. That's red, green, blue, 5 bits, 6 bits, 5 bits. What these two colors represent in, in space is effectively the endpoints of a line. You can see that in these two large uh, circles here. Um, then what you end up with is with these two high and low colors, you end up with a 4x4 four four block of pixels. Uh, these 4x4 four four block effectively only contains two bits per cell. And the two bits actually represent a discrete step between these two endpoints in color space, right? So you can see on the image here, we've got some uh, random assortment of colors that are off the line. And effectively, they get snapped to one of these four values. This is, this is the heart of DXT compression. Um, it allows for really fast load, really fast filtering. Uh, it allows you to keep a lot of blocks in a memcache line on the GPU, which is really important. Uh, and in general, it doesn't actually reduce the quality too much. But it is lossy, so it does introduce some error. So uh, let's look at the initial data set for DXT. Uh, the uncompressed images are around 37 megs. Uh, this, is, this is just the source image non-compressed, right? And I could have chosen a bigger data set size, uh, but every time I would run this set, you know, it takes a, like 15, 20 minutes to actually run and get the results, and you know, I got stuff to do today, so I can't, I can't have a 200 megabyte set. DXT1, if I just take the source data, compress it to DXT1, it gets it down to about 7.6 megs, which is good. That's fantastic, right? That's, that's exactly the type of compression size you want to see out of DXT. If we zip that data, so we do what everyone in the room is already doing, we just take that DXT data, throw it in an archive, and zip it, that ends up at about 4.82 megs, right? Or about 36%, 37% savings, which is, which is good, right? It means we're getting that in addition to what we're getting. Now, as a, a form of comparison, uh, just to look at things a different way, 
if we actually compressed each of the DXT images individually by zipping them, we get about 5.1 megs. Now, notice this is higher. The reason for this is because we're adding all of the additional zip data overhead. So we're adding the headers, the span chunks, all these other fun things. And there's some other uh, interesting nuances of why that footprint is higher that I'll get to a little bit later in the talk. Uh, the goal for this talk, though, is to beat this. We want our compression algorithm to match what zip is creating so that our in-memory version is the same footprint size as what we would expect out of our zip file. So the goal is, can we get to that? Can we beat 36.83% uh, for our hyper-compressed format in memory? To do this, I'm going to present you a bag of tricks. And these are all separate items. I'm going to talk about how, the, how each one of these items changes uh, the footprint size, the memory size, and then present them individually so that you can mix and match them depending on your input. So for lossless algorithms, so these are algorithms that do not introduce any new errors into the image. Uh, the first one we're going to cover is deinterleaving. I'll talk about that in a minute. The next one, of course, is Huffman compression. Everyone in here, if you have a basic computer science degree, you should have written a Huffman before. Uh, the next one is delta encoding. Uh, this is sort of a tricky thing that not a lot of people are aware of. And then finally, we're going to talk about code books and what code books are and how you can use them. Now, to really get some amazing results, we're going to also talk about one specific lossy technique. And this is actually going to be an expanding blocks, uh, aka region of interest based finding pattern. Um, and I think you'll love what, what we come out of that. But we're going to save that to the end because it's sort of the big reveal. So let's start at the top with DA we're leaving. Uh, again, as mentioned before, here is a standard DXT block. You've got your high color and your low color and your 4x4 four four set of selector bits. Now, in memory, in GPU memory, CPU memory, and on disk in a DDS format, uh, effectively you concatenate these blocks in memory. So you've got your high, lover, high color, low color selector bits, high color, low color selector bits, high color, low color selector bits. The idea with deinterleaving is what if we actually separated those out? What if we put all of our high and low colors together and then put all of these selector bits together? The intent here is that uh, for zip compression, which is basically um, a modified version of uh, LZW, uh, what they create is actually a window. And they say, we're going to analyze and we're going to inflate or deflate. Uh, it's another compression algorithm. We're going to deflate everything within this window and then move on to the next window and deflate everything in that window. So by deinterleaving our data, putting all of our colors and then all of our selector bits in effectively two separate bins, what we're trying to do here is optimize for, for the zip compression format. So we're trying to pack as much duplicate data into each one of those sliding windows as we can to hopefully increase the amount of compression we get. So let's check out what that looks like. So with DXTI, uh, I'm, I've, I've got each one of these techniques segmented out with sort of a different uh, enunciation at the top. So deinterleaving. So again, the DXT1 original footprint was 7.63 megs. The interleaved version is 7.63 megs. Now again, no compression has occurred here. All we've done here is just moved around the selector bits and color bits so that they're sort of uh, homogeneous in their, in their sorting here. Now the zip, here's fantastic. We've actually went to 43% savings, right? Now if you remember, uh, th there's basically about a 10%, I think, savings here. Uh, this is fantastic. This is the end result, right? So simply by deinterleaving your data, you get about 10% savings there, which is good. 10%, uh, 15% savings there, which is fantastic. Um, and, and this is optimized. So this is, this is exactly what we wanted to see. So that's good. Uh, the next question is, can we reduce the amount of unique data in the sliding window even further? such that zip can compress it even further. Uh, to do that, we're going to look at a common compression technique called Huffman. Uh, now, Huffman is effectively a dictionary creation system. So dictionary systems all work in a very specific way. Effectively, they create a dictionary symbol of unique values that exist in the stream. And then they replace the instance of that symbol in the data stream with a minimal bit code representation of that. So for instance, uh, Morse code is a perfect example of that. They analyzed uh, the English language, and they said E is the most common character in the English language. Therefore, we're going to represent E with a single beep. Uh, so then when you, anytime you're doing scans and whatnot, E is represented in the least value possible. Uh, for an example of this, let's say we've got uh, this string, uh, four A's, two B's, and a C, which is uh, with 8-bit ASCII is about uh, 56 bits, right? Um, in Huffman, if you, if you just looked at the compression stream, A is going to be the most common symbol, so it's only going to get uh, 
the 0 bit. B is the second most symbol, so it's going to get the 1 bits. And then C is the third symbol here, so it's going to get 2 bits. So we go from 56 bits to 8 bits. And I know there's some of you in the audience who are saying, like, actually, that should be a little bit different depending on which Huffman version you use. We're going to use this as an illustration. Please consult Wikipedia for all the different uh, versions that you can find about Huffman. It's actually uh, staggering how many different versions of Huffman are out there. So make sure you're tuning that as you see fit. So let's look at what this did to us. So we've got DXTIH. So this is D interleaving uh, plus Huffman. And also I want to point out at the top here, I'm noting that uh, Huffman and the usage of Huffman requires you to define a symbol size. Now for this test here, I've actually chosen 16-bit uh, symbols for my colors and 8-bit symbols for my selectors. And this, this has a big bearing on how things work, right? If I were to use 16-bit for selectors, I get less value. If I, get, if I use 8 bits for colors, I get less compression, et cetera, et cetera. So let's take a look at this. So standard again, 7.63 megs for DXT. Uh, DXT IH, DIH, so de interleaved with Huffman encoding, is about 40%. So this is not as good as we saw before. We're introducing a little bit of noise into the stream here. Uh, when you add in the zip, though, uh, you get back to about, uh, you know, one, we only get about 1% savings by adding the Huffman. Uh, so we didn't get much benefit. Um, one important note to hear is, though, that, again, this is optimized for your colors up top. And basically, what I was doing was optimizing for my set. Now, if you take that into account, what you should really be doing is finding the optimal bit encoding. Um, for what I did in this test, I just used an 8-bit row of 4x4 blocks. So I just took the 4x4 and just, and just you know, sort of made that one symbol. Uh, in reality, you should scan your data input to determine what the optimal combination provides, right? So the blog Sebi Live, uh, and you can see the link at the bottom of the slide there, uh, did a similar test. Uh, where they basically figured out what the multiple pairings were to determine the best symbol orientation for this exact type of compression. Uh, in their particular data set that they were using, they found that two by two blocks of selector bits produce the highest number of duplicate symbols. You can see that as the high value there in the frequency. Um, in reality, before you actually compress your data, you should be doing this. You should be going through per texture, finding out what the optimal solution is, and compressing that. And uh, in reality, you should all have build farms in here. This is the modern gaming age. You should have some ability to kick off a nightly build to a farm of servers that bake all your data. So the compression or the processing involved with generating this data should not be that important to you. So Huffman provided great reduction for the base stream, but didn't provide too much help with our zip compression, right? So we got our base data compressed very nicely, but when you put zip on top of it, we didn't see too much of a help. Now, this is okay. This is what we want, right? We want that base non-zip compressed data to start getting lower so it matches zip. Uh, so delta encoding, let's talk about this. Delta encoding will effectively encode a stream of data by replacing each element in the stream with a value that represents the data from the previous sum. The goal here is to reduce the dynamic range of symbols that could exist in the stream, right? So Huffman encoding will basically replace the symbols in the stream based upon frequency with minimal bit representations. Delta encoding will scan through the string before that and basically truncate, concatenate, and quantize to create more of the low band unique signals. A uh, perfect example of this. So we've got this uh, string here, uh, or this set of numbers, uh, 155, 156, yada, yada, yada. Now, if we just threw this at Huffman, uh, the only symbols that we would find here as duplicates are basically the 157s right there. Uh, that would, Huffman would say that's the most frequent symbol. That would get the lowest bit set. Now, if we run this through delta encoding first, what happens is we create 155, 11006413. Uh, so basically what you're seeing here is that what we do is we say the first symbol is 155, the next symbol is, only, is, is add 1, the next symbol to that is add 1 to that value, the next symbol to that is add 0, add 0, add 64, add 1, add 3. What we've done here effectively is increased the number of duplicate symbols in the stream by encoding the delta between the values as opposed to the actual values themselves. So this decreases the dynamic range of the stream. So let's see how this did for us. Uh, so DXT IHD with delta encoding. Uh, base, again, 7.63 megs. Uh, Non-compressed, so non-zipped, so just taking the DXT data itself, about 41%. That's good, right? Um, and about 45% reduction for the zipped version. And that, that's great, right? Uh, the problem here is we're starting to see this plateau, right? We're not getting huge results by squeezing this stream itself. Uh, it might be worth, you know, sort of looking at a different direction. And with that, we take a look at codebooks. 
Um, effectively, we create a code book by scanning the DXT image and create a code book that lists all the unique symbols, uh, sort of like the dictionary method, and then we delta encode those unique values, right? In the DXT block stream, so, so basically we create all the, this unique stream of colors, we delta encode that, and then in the block stream, we go back and we list a 256-bit index into this code book. Now, of course, some of you in the audience should say, hey, wait a minute, what if you've got more than 256 colors? That's okay. Uh, what we actually do is we create a sliding window approach to ensure that you'll always have a 256-bit index. So basically what we do is, for the entire list of uh, colors in your code book, you basically say, I'm going to create uh, a window of the first 256 values. Those will be numbered 0 to 255, then the next set of 256, and then the next set of 256, and the next set of 256. Uh, and then in your actual index data stream, uh, you're going to make a reference into the proper bin of 256 values. And there's some interesting ways to make sure that this works. Uh, there's lots of stuff on Wikipedia. I would highly recommend you go take a look at that because I don't have time today to explain the specific nuances. So with that, we actually got some, uh, some different results. Um, it, it gave some really good ones. So first off, we're at 46% without zip compression. That's pretty amazing. Uh, and 49% with zip compression. So we're still sort of chasing the dragon of zip compression and, and trying to track that down. Um, but again, we're not seeing the huge jumps in savings that we're expecting. Or we haven't broken that 50%. Uh, and there's got to be a better way to do that. And with that, we're going to talk about expanding blocks. Now, this is a lossy technique, but I think you're going to like the results, and so that's why I want to bring it up today. So the point here is that adjacent DXT cells often share color profiles, right? So 4x4 four four and the block next to it and the block below it and the block uh, in, in adjacent direction to it, they're, they're, the way that artists and, and pictures work, you know, the number of, of pixels we have on the screen, chances are those colors are all correlated. So what if we used an 8x8 cell instead of a 4x4, just hypothetically? We stored one high and low color per 8x8, and then we stored six 64 two-bit selectors. What would this do to our image? What would the results be? Well, let's take a look at that. What you're seeing on the screen here is uh, two images. The left is the uh, original. The right has been compressed with 8x8 uh, blocks instead of 4x4 DXT blocks. From this distance, uh, you really shouldn't see much of a problem. Uh, you can see a little bit of banding, a little bit of quantization, maybe some blocks for the full image. Uh, but in general, you shouldn't see anything wrong. It's not until we zoom in that you actually start seeing problems. And even here, it's pretty hard to notice. I want to point out where the errors are here. If you look at the top of the bird's beak, you can see some blocking artifacts there. Uh, you can see some graininess sort of at the bottom of the background. You can see the quantization of steps of colors there. Uh, but in general, this image performs very well at 8x8 blocks. Here's another example. Uh, this is from the Kodak suite as well. Uh, at this distance, you really shouldn't see much of a problem. Um, again, this is 8x8 block compressed, right? Uh, we see actually see less problems than the parrot uh, because there's a lot less smooth gradients in this image. Uh, and there's, there's more general sort of sub-noise, which helps hide the DXT artifacts. Now, when we zoom in on her chin, uh, you actually start seeing the problems uh, pretty badly. Uh, here you actually see the, the block and the color truncation on her necklace, as well as some clipping on her chin there. You can actually see these problems. But again, you have to zoom in all the way to look at these. Now, if someone's chasing you around with a rocket launcher at 60 frames a second, you're probably not going to care. Uh, here's a trick question. Uh, which one's compressed? Now, this is an in-game texture, right? So this is something you would see. This is something an artist would generate to, to put in your environment. Which one of these is compressed? Well, of course, with this normal trend, the one on the left is the original. The one on the right is the compressed version. Uh, but could you really tell, especially with this type of image? Even when we zoom in, can you tell which one of these has been quantized 8x8 blocks and which hasn't? So let's look at the results here. This is awesome, right? With 8x8 blocks explicitly, so we're using 8x8 blocks everywhere, we actually end up with our zipped and our non-zipped memory footprint at exactly the same size. 67.7% savings, taking the original 37 megs down to 2.46. This is exactly what we were looking for in this research. We were trying to find a way to make the uncompressed version in memory match what we would get out of a zip. And we did it by combining Huffman encoding, deinterlacing, uh, and doing 8x8 blocks. It's fantastic, oh, as well as code books. So now let's talk about what everyone else in here. So you remember that triangle, right? So everyone else in here is saying, well, what about the triangle? We've gotten speed and we've gotten quality, or, or we've gotten compression size and we've gotten quality. Now let's talk about speed. 
So for the style I just showed you, uh, which is uh, deinterleaving, Huffman styles, uh, delta encoding of code books with eight by eight blocks, uh, using CS101 Huffman and delta encoding. So I didn't do anything special here. I didn't spend any time optimizing my Huffman decompression or my delta encoding. I just threw it in there. Uh, with at about 67.8% savings, uh, I was getting about 73 megapixels a second on a single core, right? So this is one core doing this compression, which is fantastic, right? If you go to two cores, right, that's 114, three cores, start getting into some of the numbers that you start seeing here. Um, the cool thing here is that that's 1.32 bits per pixel. That's fantastic. DXT is four bits per pixel, and with this technique, we get it down to about 1.32. That's awesome. So here's the big reveal, right? This is, this is the, the entire thing. Well, what if we, why stop at eight by eight blocks? What if we actually modified our image heuristics to sort of scan based upon the frequency of the image and use somewhere between four and 16 by 16 blocks? We do the same thing. We deinterleave, delta encode, and Huffman encode them. With this, we get about 80% reduction at 93 megapixels a second for diffuse textures only. Um, and that gets us to down to 0.8 bits per pixel. That is amazing, right? For one core, you're telling me I can get 0.8 bits per pixel and I can decompress 93 megapixels a second. That's awesome. This is fantastic, right? Of course, you have to do all this stuff offline and you know, compress it properly, but that's a separate thing. So the bigger reveal is that uh, once I came to all this research and got all this stuff done, a couple days later, uh, a very got young, friendly gentleman named Rich Geldrich, who I've worked with at my previous companies, decided to uh, put his Crunch codec, which is his version of texture compression online. Uh, it's uh, licensed very uh, generally. You should go check it out. It's on, uh, you know, click that link there and go check it out. Uh, he does about the same, about between 0.8 and 1.25 bits per pixel for his texture compression for diffuse textures. For normal, he, for normal textures, he gets about 1.75 to 2 bits per pixel, which is still really amazing. Like This is cutting edge for game textures without having to go through a full DXT or a full JPEG 2000 stack. The thing here is different is that he gets about 256 megatexels a second decompression single core. I was only able to get 93, so he's got some dark voodoo in there that really changes the game. Again, his stuff is up on code.google.com. You can get it, you can use it in your game. Uh, I forget what the licenses are, but you should definitely go check that out. So takeaways. Um, it's actually easy to get really simple savings with really simple algorithms if you just concatenate them in the right way. Uh, most importantly, your mileage may vary for texture types. What works for an ambient occlusion texture really well may not work for a DXT texture. So it's important to optimize and combine each of these sort of things to put them together to figure out what texture profile works best for you. And it's best to spend offline doing your compression. You want to spend all of your time online while the game is running, while you're fighting for that 16 uh, millisecond frame to get you 60 hertz. You want all of that time to go towards what you need. You want to be spending a lot of time decompressing and compressing. So do all of your compression offline and do your decompression online. So that's it for me. Big thanks to Rich Geldrich, John Brooks, and Ken Adams for their help in this talk. You can see our final table here. And feel free to contact me anytime you need questions, colton at google.com. Thank you all very much. Have a good day.